John Henry Harden's family uh, originally came here from France. The Harden is a, is a French name, and they were French Protestants, also known as the Huguenots. And they came over here uh, apparently in the mid-1700s from France, uh, most likely from Baltimore. And uh, they came down the, through the uh, Great Valley, through the Carolinas, and into North Carolina, and from there, uh, about the time the uh, Cherokee Indians were moved out of this state, they came down into Georgia and established themselves in Cherokee County. John Henry himself was born in a little community called Ophir in the northeast section of Cherokee County near Ballgram. Um, don't know a, a great deal about his early life. We do know that at one point he went to work in one of the gold mines here in uh, Cherokee County and left the mine when it flooded in the early 1900s. From there he went into farming and he really did well at farming. John Henry was a very bright man, very aggressive businessman, did very well in farming and every year he increased his land and his planting and his, the, uh, the crops that he'd take to market. Uh, eventually he either owned several hundred acres or he also had leased several hundred acres from the Georgia Power Company in the Etowah Valley. And in 1906 he bought a large farm in the bend of the river in southern Cherokee County. Uh, continued his farming operations, continued to expand his activities, and, and by the 1910s, he was one of the largest farmers in Cherokee County and one of the largest farmers in the state. In 1916, there was a terrible flood in, uh, in Cherokee County. The rain started in July and didn't stop till the end of August. The Etowah River got up way out of the banks, uh, flooded the entire Etowah River Valley all the way down to Rome and ruined John Henry's crops. Now, John Henry had to make his lease payments. He also had to pay back loans that he'd taken out to get the supplies to put the crop in the ground. All of a sudden, his crops are ruined. He has no way to make his lease and his loan payments. And he is staring ruin in the face. Well, because of his extensive holdings, John Henry had to hire people to work on his farms, and one of his field hands, one of his farm hands, came up to him and said, John Henry said, uh, you know, we know you're in a tight, and we know that you have all these crops that you can't sell because they're ruined by the flood. Uh, you have all this corn out here, and you can't feed it to your animals, and people can't eat it, but there's one thing left you can do with it, and that's make whiskey out of it. And that's exactly what he did. He harvested his corn crop. He started a, a large whiskey making operation and eventually became the largest whiskey producer in the state of Georgia. Right. Now, Mike, you wrote an article right for Georgia Backroads in 2010 about John Henry Harden. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my family is involved with the Hardens, and we'll get to that later. But I've heard stories about John Henry Harden all my life. And one day I was talking to my mother-in-law about it, and she said, Mike, you ought to write all this down somewhere so that it, it can be passed down. And I started doing that, and the thought occurred to me that this might make a good magazine article. So I took it to Georgia Backroads Magazine in Rome, Georgia. The publisher is a gentleman by the name of Dan Roper. Georgia Backroads specializes in, in Georgia topics, history, nature, um, culture, and they publish quarterly. They're, as I say, they're headquartered in Rome, Georgia, and they do a great job of uh, keeping Georgia history and, and Georgia subjects alive, and I recommend the magazine highly, not just because I was published in it, but because it's a quality piece of work. Right. I've got several back copies, old copies, if I find them, I get them. 
because they got some great articles in them. Yeah, they they uh, they publish quarterly, and they also offer back copies, and uh, you can check on the internet under Georgia Backroads, and you can order uh, back copies from them on that website. Okay, and this article is in the autumn 2010 Georgia Backroads. Yes, ma'am. Uh, John Henry. Uh, did so well with his first batch of moonshine, he decided he was going to get into it in a big way. And so <clears throat> he converted a lot of his farmland from other crops to corn. That's a staple ingredient of whiskey. And he grew more and more corn and made more and more whiskey and hired more and more people. And eventually, as I say, he became the largest single producer of, of uh, corn whiskey in the state of Georgia. The unfortunate part is that it was highly illegal to do this. Right. Um, for a long time, back back uh, in the Revolutionary War times, there have been taxes that were required to be paid on each gallon of whiskey that anybody makes, and on top of that, you have to register your still with the Treasury Department. And uh, anybody that makes as much as one drop of whiskey is required to pay taxes on that one drop. And this is the reason that making corn whiskey at home is illegal. You can do serious time for this. So, you know, despite what you see on TV or what you've, uh, you know, what you've read about the Hatfields and McCoys or whatever, it's a very, very illegal right. thing to do and you can pay dearly if you get caught at it. Yes, they want their taxes. Yes, they do. Uh, eventually, John Henry got caught and he served a series of prison sentences and when they catch you, you have to pay the back taxes. Say if they understand that you made so many thousand gallons of whiskey, you've got to pay the taxes on every drop of that whiskey um, as far back as they can prove that you did it. On top of that, you have to pay for not a fine for not registering your still. And usually there is a fine for conspiracy to do these things. So you can do a lot of jail time and get fined a whole lot of money if you decide you're going to make your own whiskey. Right. Um, How long did he serve? How long did you... The typical sentence for a bootlegger in those days was a year and a day, but if you were a major producer, you might get three years. Mm. And he served several sentences in the Atlanta Penitentiary. Um, John Henry was a very unusual person, very intelligent, uh, very willful, very honest. Uh, had a tremendous reputation in the community. Uh, Harry, you want to tell us about some of John Henry's stories about his honesty and the way he lived his life? Well, this is what my daddy told me, and I believe every word he told me, that John Henry Harden was a very honest man. Of course, my daddy made whiskey for him, and all my uncles did. And his son married, I guess it would be my niece, but now her, my cousin, which he took her life. And before he would go to prison, they said that, that they would, he was going to do away with them. And that's why they figured they did, that he did kill them, his family and uh, himself to keep them going to the federal pen. But my daddy said he was the most honest man that he'd ever had any dealings with. That he he was very honest. He didn't put up with anybody drinking. It was working for him. And he had a stash house where he his workers came in and they had a a place to feed them uh, and a place bunk house for the whiskey the guys that would come from out of state or out of town to pick up their whiskey. They had a place for them to eat sleep and when they would load their moonshine they was probably put in gallon container get glass jugs five gallon kegs whatever but mr harden kept a sheet a spread sheet if he liked a half a pint of giving you enough he would mark it down if he gave you a half a pint too much he'd also mark it down and when it equaled out to a gallon he paid. For, he he would add a gallon to the order, or he'd take a gallon off. And John Henry Harden was a religious man, very religious. 
He taught Sunday school every Sunday at Sixties Methodist Church up in Cherokee County, and was that he said was one of the best singers he ever seen. That I heard that he would come down the road on his OA models or T models, and he could hear him a singing above the racket that uh, that the truck was making. That he really enjoyed the singing, and he. Daddy told me one time that he had a team of mules that he pulled sugar with and whiskey out of the woods. And he'd bought them back from the courthouse several times. That they'd catch his mules, the man would get away, but they'd take the mules in to Coggins' barn in Canton and hold them. And then they'd auction them off and he'd send somebody to go buy his mules back. They were highly trained. They, Daddy said they'd send them into a steel house, which I guess a lot of people listening to me now don't realize what a steel house is, but it's where you manufacture your whiskey back in the woods on the branch. And those mules, they would drive them to the road and, and turn them loose. The man would get off and they would take their self into the steel house and unload their goods, load it back, and if the mules got hung up with the wagon, got to get in a tree or something, the mules would back herself up and get untangled and come on out. Well, when they got on the road, if it was going back to the stage house, they had a quick trip trace chains. And if the federal men stepped out in the road, they would trip that chain and the mules would take off and run. And that way he wouldn't have to go buy them back so many times. Then they'd arrest the man that was on the wagon seat. Right or he had sugar, or he had lids, or, or jars, whiskey, whatever. But Dad said the, the Stice house was not that much whiskey stored in the in the Stice house. That uh, the orders would come in, the driver would come in. They would he would eat, take the shower, go to bed. They would take his car that night. He knew which each steel was manufacturing whichever one that what was producing so many gallons he'd have an order for it would take the car and load it bring it back to the stage house and when the driver got up eat he would pay the man and be gone so uh, it, i mean it was a big time operation uh, back then of 20 20 outfits going and making from from 20 gallon each to 150 gallon each it's just you know, it was according to the supply and demand, and he was big enough to beat the demand. If it was a thousand gallons, they got a thousand gallons. And well, it sounded like he's a very smart man. Yeah, he, he had it all worked out. Yeah, he all he got his education in the prison. He couldn't read and write until he went to prison. And all he had to do in the federal pen was learn to read and write. And they also uh, transacted business out of the uh, federal pen. Hmm. And so Mike knows all about that, so I'm going to get back to him and let, let him tell you how he got smart. Okay. Well, John Henry was, was an intelligent person to begin with. He was also a very hard worker. And uh, it's been estimated that any given time he had 20 stills running, he had maybe 100 employees, and there may have been several hundred other people who depended on him for their living because they would sell him supplies, goods and services. Uh, there was also kind of a, a, a system where uh, you could make arrangements with John Henry and he would pay you for every gallon you made and supply you with all the steel and all the supplies. So you, he might pay you three or four dollars a gallon just to make it. But it, it wouldn't be his steel and it wouldn't be his supplies. It'd be you doing the work. And, and you taking the risk. And he'd wholesale it. Right. That's right. That, there were a lot of people that did that. There are even stories of a community on Stamp Creek where they had several families living in sort of a little camp. And all they did was make whiskey every day of the year. And that when they finally raided the camp, the federal authorities raided the camp, uh, they spilled so much mash in the stream that the horses wouldn't ford the stream. The horses don't like the smell of mash. Hmm. This is a huge operation. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of gallons a year, maybe more than that. How did they hide it from the revenueers? Well, did they the, move it around a lot, or they, they did and they didn't. Uh, 
John Henry got caught several times, but it was usually only the federal authorities and the state authorities that prosecuted him. Um, apparently, he didn't have a whole lot to fear from the local authorities. Now, you can speculate on why that was the case. Maybe paying under the table? It's possible. I'm not going to say that it happened, but I think right. it's possible. And I think that one thing that indicates that is that once uh, John Henry and his son-in-law, Gus Miller, were arrested by the local authorities and lodged in the Bartow County Jail, and the sheriff allowed them to bring in their ledger books, typewriters, and ad machines <laughs> and make a little office in their jail cell to continue to run the family business. Well, you know, I think most local authorities back in those days understood these people weren't bad people, that they were just trying to eke out a living because there wasn't much else out there. That's they probably very, got more leeway than... Yeah, that's state. very true. Yeah. Uh, the average person in Bartow County in the 1920s, 1930s when this was going on, about the only thing you could do around here was farm. You could maybe farm a little cotton for some cash and maybe, you know, raise a hogs, cattle, garden, just to eat. And in the Depression times, it was just about impossible to earn any cash. And even if you got your own land and your own farm and your own way of making a living, you still got to have a little bit of cash. There's some things you can't make yourself, right. and you still got to pay your land taxes. Yeah. And so everybody in this community was desperate for a little cash, and making whiskey was just about the only way that the average person could do it. My grandfather told me once that he had a five-gallon steel he could set on the stove top, and he fed his family for about a year off of that. And so it shows you that Yes, the people would go to whatever measure they had to to feed their families. And since the area was so poor, nobody had money to buy the whiskey. Were they sending it? It was all in other cities. I mean, they would run it to. They would run it from Chattanooga, Atlanta, yeah. okay. Macon. Uh, mostly, it, it was a third party receiving the whiskey. See, right. and. The man got paid for hauling it. He probably didn't, he didn't know who got it. He just took it, dropped it off, and was gone. So it wasn't so much people here it buying it. It wasn't the was... local people okay. buying the whiskey because he didn't bootleg. He sold it a wholesale. And cars and wagons would even come. Daddy said wagons would come and load them at night. And, you know, that, so uh. you could say that the state men just step out of the woods and stop you with your mules and take your mules and you too. So. It was on a, a state, probably out of state level, but right. that but the was whiskey was doing. High volume, high it, volume, not. Yeah, but he was, yeah, it was much as twenty operations going on at one time. That was producing. Well, I'd be intimidating myself, but uh, <laughs> out of sixty gal, sixty pound of sugar, you'd get six gallon of whiskey. So you could figure out how much. Uh, uh, it takes two bushels of cornmeal to that 60 pound of sugar to make six gallon if you get a good turnout. So you think about a thousand gallon of whiskey, you, there's a lot of material that's coming from somewhere and he had his own corn and all he had to do was produce the sugar and when he couldn't get sugar they made syrup. I heard my daddy tell us taking syrup and making whiskey. And it, he said it wasn't too good to drink, but it would do to sell. So right. it's uh, it, it's it's an art to it. Uh, passed down through, I guess, from day one that uh, I'm the only one in my family and my brothers that I know how to make it, and I have made it. And uh, but the judges and the lawyers and how people one has got to drink it along with me. But <laughs> anyway, that's. Uh, that's part of my history and part of my life. I know how it's done, but right. it's a lot of hard work, some of the hardest work you'll ever do. But it stopped with you, right? You it didn't. stopped with me. Yeah. And as far as I know, my little 25 gallon outfit is still in Cherokee County. In the way that it's not illegal to own it, it's to have a hold in it, according to the county office. But one I had had two holes. It had a top and it had one for the other one, so I I think it was legal 
but it's still in Cherokee County as far as I know. Out in the woods? No, it, it's, it's in a house. Oh, okay. It's in a house in uh, Lake Arrowhead. Hmm. It's a novelty piece now. Okay. I thought it might have been ready to go out in the woods. <laughs> no, I don't think it'd be ready to go now. <laughs> One of the things that you need to understand or you need to know about the uh, whiskey culture in order to understand what's going on is that most of the people in this part of the country came from the British Isles. And there's groups of people in the British Isles, the Welsh, the Irish, the Scots, who had a long tradition of making whiskey before this country was ever founded. And they all stayed at odds with the British authorities over there. British authorities acted like the federal government does here. They imposed taxes on the whiskey and they would make it very illegal. Uh, from time to time, the Scotch and the British and the Irish and the British would fight a war and the British would outlaw whiskey making. And it, it was uh, just a way of life in the British Isles for a lot of people to make whiskey on the sly. Well, those people disliked the British so much that they came over here to live because they had a hope there that they could own land, which they couldn't do in Britain, and also that the British wouldn't be so hard on them here. And the Scotch-Irish people particularly were famous for this. Uh, they have been a whiskey-making culture, you know, for hundreds of years. The most of the famous distilleries in Kentucky and Tennessee were founded by Scotch-Irish people who had this long tradition of making whiskey. And there was a saying that went that when the English first arrived in North America, the first thing they did was build a church. And when the Germans arrived in North America, the first thing they did was build a barn. And when the Scotch-Irish arrived in North America, the first thing they did was put up a still. And that's almost literally true, right. but you have this tradition of making your own, you have this tradition of drinking your own, and you have this tradition of doing it in defiance of the authorities. And by the 1900s, it was just second nature to most people around here that, you know, whenever they felt like it, they'd make some whiskey. Right. Just, it just came second nature. Well, well, the one thing that made John Henry's reputation was the tremendous volume that he carried on. Most moonshiners, they might have a 25, 50-gallon copper pot still, and you might make just a few gallons a run. And like Harry explained, you know, out of this much meal and sugar, you get a few gallons of whiskey. Mm -hmm. Well, John Henry, <coughs> John Henry turned moonshining into an industry, and he. About the time of, uh, of prohibition in the United States started in 1920 or 21, uh, obviously because you couldn't buy legal whiskey anymore, demand for illegal whiskey just went through the roof. And all of a sudden the moonshiners could make every drop that they sold and make tremendous profits on, on top of that. So at that point, you had developments in the moonshining industry that John Henry adopted that helped him make more and more and more whiskey. You had, before about 1920 or so, everybody made their whiskey out of just pure corn. They didn't use sugar, they didn't use syrup, they just used plain corn. Now, it didn't produce a lot of whiskey, but it was very, very high quality stuff in, yeah. in very small quantities. They also adopted different ways of making moonshine. Originally, you, you use a small copper pot still, maybe like I say, you know, the smallest ones might have been five gallons, a, a bigger one might have been 25, the biggest one you saw might be 60 or 75 gallons. Well, all of a sudden people are building 200, 300, 400 gallon stills to get additional yield. Right. And instead of chopping down a tree in the forest and using that for firewood, they started using steam boilers as a heat source. I don't, if nobody ever messed with them, but after, this moonshine business that operates today, the people, I'm sure there's been whiskey being made today. Right. But it's not being made the old fashioned way on right. copper. It's yeah. been made out of aluminum or stainless steel. Right. Or galvanized iron. Yeah, that's yeah. where they got the, the name hog liquor. Because you, you cook it all in in the same pot, you don't have no beer boxes, you don't have that. You, 
they built it in half in the ground and was a furnace around it. And they cooked the, mag, the meal, sugar, and everything in and put it in yeast and let it work itself off. Then they heat half. The, the burner usually goes around about the lower half of it. Right. And it's made out of copper cumin, propane gas. And you fire it up, and then when they get ready to, it starts to steam, that's when they call cap it. And it goes through the cap, into the thumper, out of the thumper, into the condenser, and then comes out whiskey. That moonshine in it, I mean, back when, well, well, when I done it, I built, my mine was in a barn. I had it in a barn. And I had hogs running all around. I had over 100 head of hogs and what they call pot tails. I had a trough run out from my steel. And when I'd cook it off and get my whiskey out, it's called a swap stick, kick it in, and it'd run out that, that old meal would run out in that trough, trough and hog that eat it. Then I'd wash it down with pine saw. Right. So yeah, that's one reason. I don't reckon they can come back on you now, can they? No, the statute of limitations has expired. That's one reason it's so hard to hide a still, because it smells to hide. Oh, yeah. Right. Right. Um, in addition to changing the ways that they did things, the, the types of stills they used and so forth, they adopted a different heat source. Instead of chopping down firewood out in the woods, they started using steam boilers that were fired with coke and coal. And these boilers uh, were mounted on wheels. And what they would do is they would light these boilers and heat steam and then pipe the steam through the mash inside the still. And that would heat the mash enough to make the distilling work and it still uh, it was a much more efficient way to do things. Uh, you could uh, run the, uh, the mash through the still and basically not burn it if you're using steam where it's, it's difficult to run off a, a batch in the still if you're using firewood or propane because it'll scorch and burn, give it a, a burnt taste. Well, this made a pretty good size operation, didn't it? I mean, yeah. I think most people, when they think of moonshine, they think of a little still oh, yeah. out with a little fire underneath it, and, and, you know, it just takes up a small spot. But I've seen photos of the John Henry Harden, um, his operation, and it's pretty good size. Well, those photographs came from a trial that uh, John Henry uh, experienced in, I think it was about 1927, 28. Uh, they're actually posted on the National Archives website. Right. And one of the pictures shows a steam boiler with a pipe leading from the boiler into the still. And uh, you can run, if you have enough mass, you can run that operation, you know, just about constantly because you don't have to, uh, the fire never dies out and keep it going. Right. Uh, and if, if you get uh, suspicion you're going to be raided, if that boiler is mounted on wheels, you can hits that bore up and tow it off somewhere and not lose it. <laughs> uh, we were talking about uh, the size of John Henry's operation, and yes, he did produce hundreds of thousands of gallons a year. And one thing that made that possible, well, several things made that possible. Number one, he had a ready source of labor here in the Etowah Valley area. Uh, again, people were poor, they needed work, they would do what they had to do to, to uh, support their families. They would, they would run the risk. They would run the risk. He had a, a in this farmland that he operated, he had a huge supply of corn and uh, syrup cane and things that could be used to make whiskey. Uh, even if people didn't work for him, they would uh, grow crops of grain and fruit and sell it to John Henry to make whiskey out of it. And he had a ready market. Uh, if you think about it, in the 1920s, we started to see things like textile mills develop in the towns around the Etowah Valley. Uh, Canton, Cartersville, um, Rome, Chattanooga, um, Rockmark, Marietta. Uh, people started going to the cities in search of work. These people came from the countryside and they were accustomed to drinking corn whiskey and they didn't have a whole lot of money to buy whiskey with, so you, you have a ready-made market within a few miles of the Etowah Valley here where all this was going on. And there was, for that reason, there was a big demand for John Henry's products. Um, 
John Henry uh, was, uh, if I recall correctly, arrested several times, did several stretches in prison, but he never quit making whiskey as far as I know. The judges would stand him up before the court and say, now John Henry, if, if you'll agree not to make any more whiskey, we're going to go a little lighter. But he would not agree to that because he knew that as soon as he got home, he was going to start making whiskey again and he didn't want to lie to the judge. Right. Um, John Henry had a big family. I, I think he had like 10 children. Uh, I'm not absolutely sure about that, but I think it was. And so the whole family was in, involved in the whiskey business, and particularly um, his son-in-laws, uh, two of them that I know of, Gus Miller and Alton Abernathy. And Gus Miller was kind of John Henry's business manager. He, uh, he helped run the farms. He helped operate the stills. He, provided uh, uh, management to some of uh, John Henry's properties. John Henry actually owned a substantial amount of real estate in some of the towns around here. He, he invested the proceeds of his whiskey business in other businesses. And so they, they had to be taken care of as well. Uh, and there's a story that goes around here to the effect that uh, John Henry and his son-in-law Gus Miller uh, ended up in jail in Bartow County Jail at one point, and they uh, were actually allowed to open up an office in their jail cell. They brought in typewriter and had machine ledger books and operated their business from inside Bartow County Jail. Uh, stories like that abound about John Henry, uh, and I think it's mostly because of the volume of business that he did. As we've indicated before, John Henry became known as the Moonshine King of Georgia, and his exploits are written up in, in national newspapers. Um, the uh, Atlanta Constitution had a, 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 a reporter by the name of Celestine Sibley, who's one of their better known reporters. She's been dead for several years, but she had a national reputation back in, in the 40s and 50s. And she actually interviewed John Henry at one point and I have found copies of the articles she wrote based on that interview in newspapers as far away as Chicago and Milwaukee and uh, Cincinnati. So John Henry eventually became almost a national personality. He's one of the best known people in the state uh, in his later years. Um, he was also the subject of a chapter in a book that was written about moonshining in the south back in the 70s. The name of the book was Mountain Spirits. It was written by a fellow by the name of Joe Dabney. And uh, Joe interviewed a lot of people in the Bartow County community and other people around the state in order to write this business, this book. It was uh, a, what he referred to as a chronicle of corn whiskey. And he devoted a whole chapter in that book to John Henry Harden and a fellow by the name of Duff Floyd. Duff Floyd was a federal revenue who operated out of, out of Jasper, and he chased moonshiners all over North Georgia for about 30 years. He even arrested my grandfather at one point. Uh, my grandfather used to say that he could recognize Duff Floyd's hide in a tan yard. Uh, he was persistent, he was ingenious, very, very smart guy. And probably the best thing about him, or made, the thing that made him more effective than anything else, was he wouldn't give up. If he knew somebody was making whiskey, he was going to catch him sooner or later. Um, one time he, he cut down my grandfather's still. After my grandfather had parked his truck on the side of the road and carried some supplies up into the woods, came back and moved the truck. Duff Floyd comes driving his car down the road, sees an oil stain on the road, starts looking around and tracked my grandfather's still down and, and cut it up. Hmm. Uh, these guys were, were very smart, very ingenious, and they didn't miss a whole lot. Right. The, the reason they weren't more successful than they were was that there was so much moonshining activity going on in North Georgia that they couldn't be everywhere at once. And Duff Floyd worked from, from the area from Chattanooga to Augusta and then down in the middle of Georgia. So, in that territory, there were probably thousands of moonshiners, and the odds of any one of them getting caught at a particular time are fairly small. It kind of makes you wonder why they didn't have more federal officers. 
for that area, knowing how large of an area, because all of North Georgia was making beans shine, so. Yeah, I, I think back then we had a little bit different outlook on government, that it was supposed to be a little more minimal <laughs> than it small. is now. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that the, the philosophy was, let's catch the big guys, and if some little guy's making, you know, five gallons in his chicken house, I'm not too worried about that. I'd, I'd rather get the big guy and put him out of business. Um, John Henry, uh, we were talking about John Henry's family. John Henry had uh, several children, uh, but his favorite was a, a son named Paul who was born in 1902. Paul was uh, a good-looking boy. His family had a lot of money. Uh, he was quite a catch in the neighborhood. And Paul and his family lived right down the road from my great-grandparents, the Woodalls. Now, uh, the Woodalls had a daughter who gave birth to another daughter in 1908. And then the mother died in childbirth, and the Woodalls adopted the little girl as their own and raised them as their own daughter. And she was about the same age as my grandfather, Murray Woodall. So they grew up about like brother and sister. Right. And she grew up and, and married Paul Harden in 1925. Now, Paul was heavily involved in his father's business. Um, he... Uh, was subject to being caught and arrested just like anybody else was. He and uh, he and this uh, lady's name was Lisa, Lisa and Paul Harden. She's my second cousin. Um, they married in 1925 and by 1932 they had four children. And in 19, early 1932, Paul got caught at a steal and was arrested on federal charges and he bonded out for $3,000 with his trial to be held in October. And as the trial grew closer and closer, Paul started acting oddly. He got depressed, he started drinking, which was something his father would just not allow. Uh, he developed a very, very quick temper. He was hard to deal with, nobody could uh, seemed to pacify him and, and he kept getting worse and worse and by June, I think June 20th of 1932, something terrible happened. Uh, my uncle Bruce went over to Paul and Lisa's house on a Sunday afternoon and had supper with him. And they invited him to stay and spend the night and he and Paul would go to work at the still the next morning. Well, Uncle Bruce said, well, I think I better go on back home. I've got some things I've got to do. So he went on back home. And the next morning, one of John Henry Harden's son-in-laws, Alton Abernathy, came to pick up Paul to go to work at the still. Knocked on the front door, no answer. Tried the front door, locked. Called out Paul's name, no answer. It was hot weather and the windows were open and back then houses didn't have screens on. So Alton walks around to the side of the house and looks in the bedroom window. And what he saw had to have been incredible because all five members of the family were laying there shot in the head. Now to this day nobody knows exactly what happened but it seemed at the time that it was a murder-suicide that Paul had just gone off of the deep end he decided that he wasn't going to go to jail and he wasn't going to allow his family to suffer if he did have to go. And that was what most people thought. Now there were some people that just couldn't believe that Paul would have done that because they felt like Paul was too good a man, too good a family man. Well it also seems odd to me too that he would ask Bruce to spend the night if he had planned on killing his wife and children. That that seemed odd to everybody. My grandfather never believed that Paul actually did it. He always thought that maybe Paul had crossed somebody in the whiskey business right. and they had taken it out on Paul and his family. They had a coroner's inquest at the house, the Cherokee County authorities did. The house is actually on, uh, 
on the uh, west side of the Etowah River, and it was in Cherokee County. And uh, they had a coroner's inquest. In 1932, there wasn't any really detailed forensic crime investigation. Yeah. The coroner called the jury. They took some testimony from people who, who knew the Hardens. They took some testimony from my grandfather. They identified the pistol that was found at the scene as belonging to Paul, but there were no further tests or investigations right. made. And they ruled murder-suicide. The family was buried at Stamp Creek Baptist Church the next day, on Tuesday. Um, the newspapers estimated there were 3,000 people that attended this service at this little tiny one-room country church. There, at the time, there may have been 25,000 people in Bartow County, and maybe 3,000 of them showed up from this right. funeral. Uh, I'm sure he was well-known, well-liked. Well, yeah, it was because of his father, too. I mean, yeah. everybody in Bartow County knew who John Henry was. Most people liked him. Mm -hmm. um, the family was buried in the Stamp Creek Baptist Church Cemetery. John Henry uh, arranged for the burial and, and had a magnificent burial plot built up. To, there's a huge headstone, there's, there's six individual footstones, there's a concrete wall and marble coping around the graves. Uh, it's just something you don't see in a little church cemetery. Right. Did John Henry Harden think his son did this? In the Celestine Sibley newspaper article, he made the statement that he thought Paul had just gone crazy. So I would speculate that he did, he did feel that way, mm -hmm. but I don't know that for a certainty. Right. Um, I guess you're in shock when it first happens. You don't sit and think, well, he wouldn't have done this. I mean, evidence at the time, it looked like he did. Yeah. Um, and because the house was locked from the inside, right. I mean, that doesn't mean somebody would crawl out a window, but yeah. it did make it look like that that was the case. Um, this was an incredible sensation all over the United States. Reports about this murder-suicide circulated in the, the New York newspapers, Chicago newspapers, uh, all over the country. And it was one of the first cases of, of mass murder-suicide that I can recall finding anywhere. Uh, back then in 1932, people just didn't kill six people at a time. Right. They may do that today, but they didn't do it back then. And because of the sensationalism and because of the the horror of the whole thing, uh, the community was just shocked and appalled by the whole situation. Right. Uh, there were people who didn't want Paul buried in the church cemetery. I heard my mother talk about that. You know, threats made against uh, the grave and so forth, and I think that may be one reason why the elaborate uh, headstones and so forth were arranged on top of this grave. Right. Um, that made a, a big difference in John Henry's life, obviously it would to everybody. But the stories are that John Henry just never was the same, and that's understandable with this horrible situation. And but he wouldn't get out of the moonshine business. He kept making moonshine, getting arrested, going to jail, making moonshine, getting arrested, going to jail. Right. Uh, finally, because he had to pay taxes and fines for every gallon of whiskey he ever made or sold, uh, the federal government pretty much bankrupted him. He ended up selling most of his farmland. He ended up losing about everything he had. And by the time that he was uh, released from jail on his last sentence, he was confined to a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And he died in 1943 and was pretty much penniless, as I understand it. Um, the, th the fact that he's dead, though, hasn't stopped all the folklore. You still right. find people like us in, in North Georgia that know and remember, you know, John Henry Harden. Yeah. Harry, you got anything you remember more about him? Well, the only thing that Daddy told me that he said he, uh, that John Henry said it when he made a, a hundred thousand dollars, he's going to quit. 
and when he made a hundred thousand, he wanted another hundred. Mm -hmm. So, in that sense, words he would, he got into money. He got greedy then, and probably that was his downfall. Right. And uh, but Daddy said he was the most honest man that, that he'd ever had any dealings with. It just you know, he taught Sunday school on Sunday, went to church through the week, sang. And, but still, he was in the illegal business. And he had a, a rough life, I guess. He had plenty of money, I guess, at the time, but in the end, he didn't take none of it with him. That's right. So None of us do. None of us do, and I don't know nobody I could leave mine to and bring it to me, so <laughs> I'm going to enjoy it now. That's right. There you go. Are we about out of... Yeah, we're, we're coming up close to okay. time. Okay. All right, Mike. You got uh, it. I'd just like to to say thank you all for, for having us oh, down you're here. Quite and, uh, welcome. Maybe you can look up that thing and we can come back and do a show on that. Uh, okay. Surveying uh, outfit. Right. Harry brought with him today a surveying outfit that uh, was handed down to him. And we're gonna try to we're gonna try to do something with that. Find it. Yeah, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I never in my wildest dreams thought that I would ever participate in a radio show. This has been quite a, <laughs> quite, quite an experience, and I really appreciate it. Well, we are quite happy to have y'all. Uh, I wish more families would come forward and talk about their families. Uh, it, it's a great tale, but it's a sad tale. Uh, but what a family. I mean, between oh, yeah. uh, the previous show of the Woodall family and then the Hardens, um, Great stuff, guys. It's all connected together. It does. It know. does. Yeah, it sure does. And we appreciate y'all coming in and doing both these shows. And we will be back next week here at Bartow Ancestors. We appreciate y'all being here. Go see our sponsor, Ace Hardware, out at 924 West Avenue. Thank you, gentlemen, very much for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. See y'all next week.